a warm welcome today. We're going to begin our meeting here with a word of prayer. If you'd find your place, please, and uh, make ready to worship the Lord. We're going to bow in prayer here together. Psalm 127 says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Let's go before him this morning in light of that verse that without him we can do nothing, but with him all things are possible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into thy presence this morning wishing to worship thee in spirit and in truth. Desiring, Lord, to have our Savior highly exalted, to have thy name honored and magnified in this place. It is our desire that self may be placed beneath the feet, that Christ may be highly exalted. We pray, Lord, that it would be upon his face that we look, that it would be towards thee that we offer our praise. We ask of thee, Lord, help us to worship in such a way that is guided by thy spirit, not by our flesh, not by our soul, but by thy spirit. We pray, Lord, that every part of this meeting, from this prayer, these words that are being offered up now until the closing prayer, may everything in between be acceptable in thy sight, and not just acceptable, but may it be something that blesses thee. We might be able with the psalmist to say, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and help us, Father, with all that is within us to bless thee. We acknowledge, Lord, that there is no one worthy but thee. We do not pretend to be anything special today. We acknowledge, Father, that thou art a good God, an almighty God, and we worship and adore thy name. We thank thee for the gift of salvation that has been so freely offered unto us. We rejoice, Lord, that we never had to purchase it or earn it, but freely it has been given and freely we have received. We thank you for such a marvelous gift. We praise thee, Lord, that our sins have been washed away, removed as far as the east is from the west. We praise thee, Lord, that it is thy character that has chosen to remember them no more. We rejoice at such a marvelous truth. We thank thee for that promise that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. We know how we joy and rejoice in grace today. We thank Thee, Lord, for peace, peace that passes all understanding. We ask of Thee, Lord, this morning as we meet beneath this tent, we pray that Thy Spirit may come, taking all of these truths and so many more, applying them to our hearts, causing us to see the reality of Thy Word and the reality of Thy presence. O oh Lord, help us, we pray. Meet with us now. Prepare us to meet with Thee. And we ask, Lord, Thy blessing. For we ask it in Jesus Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Let's sing together our first hymn. If you'll take your hymn sheet with me, please, and turn to hymn number one. Come ye that love the Lord, and let your song be known. Join in a song with sweet accord, and thus surround the throne. Hymn number one. Come ye that love the Lord and let your song be
Remain standing with me, please. Let's sing that last verse together. Look at those words. Then let our songs abound. And every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high. This is not heaven. It only gets better for the child of God. And we're marching through his grounds to fairer worlds, to fairer lands. And I hope you know that and believe that. And looking forward to those days when we shall be with him for all eternity. Let's sing that last verse. When we come to that chorus, we'll sing an a cappella. may be seated. Let's take God's word together as Tommy comes along to lead us and turn to Ephesians chapter 6, if you would please. Ephesians chapter 6, we'll be reading verse number 10 to verse number 18. Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual weaknesses, wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that we may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, there, have, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, for with you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Amen. Thank you, Tommy. We believe God will bless the reading and hearing of His Word. We're going to sing our second hymn, and uh, when, when we come to the last verse, we'll invite the children to the front for our children's talk. Hymn number two, God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Beautiful hymn written by William Cowper, or Cooper, as some wish to pronounce it, and a man who knew what it was to be afflicted with great grief and difficulty and oftentimes didn't quite understand it all, but he trusted, he learned to trust God in the midst of his difficulties. And this is a, a hymn written about that very thought, that truth. Let's stand together, hymn number two.
right, you may be seated. Children, it is lovely to see you today. Now, I wonder, children, girls, do you want to maybe sit back there on that row with Micah so you're not stood up there? That might help you. Joss will be happy to scooch down a little bit. That's good. Now, who knows? Can you remember what's the next piece of armor that we need to put on? Who remembers the first piece we talked about a couple of weeks ago? What was the first piece of armor that the soldier of Christ has got to put on? Yes. The girdle. Very good. The girdle of truth. Good. And the next, the second piece of armor that we were meant to put on. Harper, do you remember what that second piece of armor was? No. What's the Matthew, do you remember? Ooh, not quite. Not we haven't got there yet, but we will. Zeke. The armor, yes. We're going to which part of that armor are we going to put on? So we've got the belt on, the, the girdle of truth. Emmanuel. The breastplate of righteousness. And who knows what's next in the line of of the uh, armory that we're going to put on. Titus, not the shield of faith. That's a good one, but that's not next. Who knows what is next? Aliyah, pardon me. The helmet, no, that's a good one, but that's not next. Not the helmet. Yes. Not the sword. That's good as well. We're getting there. You're listing everything else. Kara. I don't know. Didn't quite hear you, but I'm going to take your word. But you said shoes. Is that what you said? No, <laughs> at least she's honest. <laughs> at least she's honest. <laughs> Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, anybody know what that is right there? That is a certified, it is a boot indeed, a certified official military grade combat boot. It's a big one because it's come from our brother Tian, but that's okay. There it is, a big boot. That's a combat boot. You need that. Soldiers are issued that when they are given their uniforms. And what's the importance of having a military boot? Now, they didn't have boots like this in the days of our Lord, did they? What kind of a shoe did they have on their feet in those days? Any ideas? Yes. A sandal. That's right. And the same principle, something very substantial or thick on the bottom and a, and a wrapping of leather all the way, quite a way up. And that would give a lot of support. Why is it important to have on shoes when you're going to war? Boots, sandals of any kind. Why is that important? Eliana? So you don't hurt your feet. Absolutely. Did you know that enemies for centuries have set traps for the opposing armies? Did you know that? The enemy is not nice. And the enemy would oftentimes set traps. Sometimes they'd put spikes, sticks, and all sorts of other things just below the surface of the ground so you wouldn't even see it. So when you stepped, if you didn't have shoes on, guess what would happen? Oh, straight through your foot. And if your feet are hurt, what happens to the rest of you? Emmanuel, how are you going to move? If you can't walk on your feet in a battle... And the enemy is clever. Satan is clever and he knows that. So he's trying to keep us from moving forward. Satan is always trying to keep the church of Jesus from moving forward, from taking steps in their Christian walk, from advancing. And so therefore, we've got to protect our feet. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but I want you to listen through the morning service. Some of you listened very well last week and you were able to tell me what we talked about. But one of our friends yesterday, I noticed a pair of boots she had on. Watch this. Our dear friend Carmen had these especially made for her birthday. Now, you might think they're just a pair of normal Nike trainers, but they were specifically designed. Now, somebody tell me, what color is on the bottom? Say it out. What is red a picture of in the scriptures? Or well, sometimes when we talk about Christian things. Yes, the blood of Jesus Christ. And so Carmen had these designs specifically to remind herself that every step she took was covered and protected by the blood of the Savior. Isn't that wonderful? And what color are the laces? Red. So she wanted to remind herself that she's protected by the blood of the Lamb beneath and above. Now you'll notice these shoes are very interesting. What color is the check on the right, on the outside of the shoe? We're not gray. But what color is that? Black. What's black sometimes a picture of in the Christian Christian life? Eliana? 
sin or Satan good. And what color is the check on the inside? Shout it out, white. And white's a picture of purity. And so she wanted to remind herself that outside of Christ is sin and darkness, but in Christ is purity and holiness. That's pretty special, isn't it? And then she had one more little, little touch added. She had two words sewn on the back of her boots. Can you see what those two words are? Can anybody read those? Go ahead, Matthew. Grace and truth. That's amazing. Every step she takes is, is covered and surrounded with grace and truth. That's really interesting, isn't it? I didn't know you could do that with a pair of shoes, did you? And, uh, boy, and somebody saw those yesterday and said that would go perfect with your talk on the shoes being shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So pretty marvelous. And grace and truth come between the darkness and the light. It's the grace and truth of God that brings us out of darkness and into light. So that's pretty. I'm gonna, I don't think my foot can fit in those, but if they, if they would, I'd wear them. Good. Okay, you can be seated. We'll, uh, hopefully you'll listen to the sermon and hear more about these shoes, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Let me give a few notices and announcements to uh, some of our older friends here today. We're glad that you're here. If you're visiting for the first time, we welcome you and hope you've already been warmly welcomed as you may, found your way to this property. Uh, just after the meeting today, we'll have a lunch as we usually do. And if you're visiting, we'd love to invite you to join with us. And then later this afternoon, there's a Sunday school for children at three o'clock and a Bible study for adults at three at the same time. We have a children's marquee there at the bottom of the field. And of course, this one, we'll use both of them uh, we, are, we have plenty of water on the field today. We try to keep everybody cool and hydrated, so you make use of those things as you need them. Uh, God willing, we'll meet together this evening at 6 p.m. for our evening service. I will uh, be away. Some of us will be away this evening, headed down to Christ Church for the funeral services for Madeline Cash. So please keep us in your prayers, especially keep the Cash family. We'll tell you some more about that in, in a little while. Now, this Wednesday, there is no sword club. The prayer, the prayer meeting and Bible study will be here as usual at 7. Thursday evening, the young adults Bible study at the chapel at 7. Saturday, God willing, the usual activities uh, with the open air outreach and prayer meeting at 5 o'clock at the chapel. Lord willing, Sunday we'll be gathered together uh, here again beneath the tent. A few other things coming up. The last week of July the 25th, that's a week from tomorrow, is the first week of summer camp for our children. And uh, we have about 200 children signed up for the first week of camp and about 200 teenagers signed up for the second week. So please pray for us. Uh, there will be a lot, there's been already a lot of work gone into the preparations for summer camp. So please pray for the children and for the workers that hearts will be softened and that souls will be saved. During those two weeks of camp, the last week of July and the first week of August, we will not have our usual uh, prayer meeting here on a Wednesday night that will take place at the camp property. And there'll be many buses that'll shuttle people there um, up in Droitwich near Worcester. It's quite a, a bit of a spin, just over an hour's drive. But uh, we'd love for you to come and see the camp and to be a part of those services. Always very special. So we'd love to have you. If you'd like to come, there's a sign-up sheet at the back for those who are expecting to take a mini bus up to, uh, to that um, Camp Victory Wednesday night meeting. That's not this coming Wednesday, but the following. And I also remind you of the Ireland Awakening Mission. In Derry, looking forward to that, Friday the 12th and Saturday the 13th of August, praying for souls to be saved. There's a team of folks going up the week before and a few others going up uh, a day or two before, but we're praying that God would bless that in a special way. And also the Heritage Bible Conference at Crown Hall, the 25th through the 27th of August. You can book your space now. And this is the first year that we've done this. Uh, we are trusting God. We believe He's led us uh, to, to hold this conference, our pastor from my pastor from the States is coming over to preach, and some others will be preaching as well, but we're praying for a blessed time together that last uh, weekend of August. I think that's all the notices we have. A few very urgent prayer requests. I uh, just got a message today from uh, Michael Nolan that his uncle David Nolan passed away this morning and uh, went home, we trust went home to be with the Lord, so please pray for the Nolan family as funeral arrangements will be made and to pray for souls to be saved through this. Praying for the Cash family, especially as Madeline's funeral takes place. There's a service tonight, this afternoon at 4, and then the uh, funeral service tomorrow at 11 a.m. So we're praying much for the Cash family, Johnny and Emery in particular. Praying that we might be a, a bit of light. We might have be able to offer the balm of Gilead that would soothe the sick soul. So please pray for these brokenhearted dear ones 
and the loss of their little girl. Praying for Joshua and his family, continuing to pray for him and uh, his, his healing. Praying for the Jackson family and all the challenges that surround uh, Joshua's illness, but we're trusting the Lord and looking to him. Praying for Larry Doran as well. He's had a few, a couple of stable days, so please keep him in your prayers. And uh, praying for my mother-in-law. She had her operation this week and uh, praying for her recovery and a list of other requests that we will continue to pray for. Pray for Leanne's mother was taken into hospital uh, last week, uh, last Sunday morning, and um, praying much for her and, and many, many others. I, I, I've also been told that Albert Smith, he's a pastor uh, amongst the um, Traveler Gypsy Church, Light and Life Mission, who had a stroke this week and is in hospital. So please keep Albert Smith and his family in your prayers as well. Let's bow our heads together at this time and, and bring some of these petitions before the Lord. Father in heaven, we come before thee with hope and expectation because we believe, Lord, that there's nothing too hard for thee, that all the challenges that life throws at us and all the pitfalls and discouragements, we acknowledge, Lord, that thou art able, thou art a conquering God. We acknowledge that many of these, these illnesses and heartbreaks, all of these things flow from a the consequence and result of being alienated from thee. We pray that the, the great damage, the greatest damage of a soul that is separated from thee, that that would be repaired first, that that would be healed, that souls would be saved, born again. Our Savior told us we would see greater things than even the miracles that he performed. And truly, there is no greater miracle than the salvation of a soul. And we pray, Lord, for more souls to be saved. We pray for a greater burden and desire for lost souls. But we also cannot help but feel empathy and sympathy for those who are suffering today. We believe, Lord, that that is a result of having the heart that is found in Thee, the result of being made in Thine own image, that we would weep with those who weep, that we would look upon a hurting people and be filled with compassion. So we ask of thee, based upon that, we ask of thee for mercy and for healing. We ask of thee, Lord, to do what doctors cannot, what the hands of man have never been able to do. We ask of thee, Lord, to do that work which only the power of thy spirit can accomplish. We ask, Lord, work and move where it would please thee most. We lift these dear ones to us, uh, to thee now. We lift the Nolan family and the loss of David to thee and pray for their family. We pray especially for David's wife. His children and grandchildren, be near to them, Lord. Save many souls. We thank thee that he called upon the name of our Savior. And we trust that he is with thee now. We pray for the Cash family, especially for Johnny and Anne Marie. And we ask of thee, Lord, in mercy, bring healing to their broken hearts. Lord, help them to turn to thee in their hour of brokenness and sadness. We lift all of these requests and petitions before thee now. And ask of thee, Lord, please move in a way that would bring thee the most honor and glory. Fill us with faith and expectation, we pray. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together one more time before we look at God's word. Hymn number three, afflicted saints to Christ draw near. Your Savior's gracious promise here. His faithful word you can believe that as your days, your strength shall be. Hymn number three, let's stand as we sing. Oh, 
That is a beautiful promise. As thy days, thy strength shall be. Several years ago, when my wife and I, not long after my wife and I moved to this country, we were going through a very challenging time, really in, in many ways. But in one of those ways was financially. We'd come over, sent, sent out as missionaries uh, from our home church in Tennessee. And uh, sometimes... Uh, some of our support, financial support, uh, wasn't wasn't there. I can remember one of those times uh, having a little bit less than what was necessary and needed. And I said to my wife, we don't have any, any more money, nothing in the savings and negative in the checking. And I said, so we're going to have to make do with what we have. And uh, a day or two later, I had a, an envelope come through the post and I opened it up. There were three things in the envelope. One was a blank sheet of white paper that was tri-folded. And as I opened up that piece of paper, there was a 20-pound note in the middle of it and a little scripture card. And the scripture card was that verse, Deuteronomy chapter 33, that promised about verse 25, Thy shoes shall be iron and brass, and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. And it was a promise, a reminder from God, that if he gave me another day, he'd give me what I needed for that day. And sometimes it's easier to say that than to trust it. But he has proven that to be true and to be the case thus far. Ephesians chapter 6. We are in a war. Not a game, but a war. And we must be equipped. We must be ready. I wonder this morning, are you ready? The majority of those who call themselves Christians or believers simply are not ready. They do not think soberly. They are not serious about the things of God. They're very flippant. They quarrel and squabble over silly, meaningless things. When their preferences and their opinions aren't honored and, and answered, well, they are very easily offended. They are totally unaware. They know in principle and in word that we're in a war. But their behavior and their conversation betrays them. Because if they really believed that they were in the heat of a battle, they would not behave the way that they often do. Are you ready? Are you ready to stand against the wiles of the devil? Are you ready to stand against darkness, against sin, We've been talking about all that has been provided by God to help us to stand. The girdle or the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. And today we come to the third piece of armor that is offered to us in God's armory. The third thing that we're commanded, by the way, not suggested, 
but commanded to put on. You are commanded, take unto you. Paul did not say, well, if you'd like, there is armor that you could use. No, he said, wherefore, because we're fighting not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, wherefore, take, I command you, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. Meaning, if you do not take it, you will not stand. You wonder why so many Christians are bowing the knee and tapping out and running away because they have not taken this portion seriously. Take unto you the whole armor of God. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's a command. We've got to have the right shoes on our feet. Time and experience has proven to man, has taught man, that if he ever hopes to be successful in a battle, he's got to take care of his feet. They tell me that in 1914, nobody really thought much of a pair of boots. But the moment that the First World War kicked off and thousands and thousands began to be slain and killed, Boots became a very hot item. Boots became a necessity. Before 1914, nobody thought about boots. But the second that war began, you couldn't find enough pair. There weren't enough boots. And the moment you realize we're in a battle, the moment is the moment you'll grab your boots. And I wonder today if you've got the right shoes on. In some instances in battle, it really wouldn't do you much good to put on a breastplate. Wouldn't do you much good to put on a helmet and a shield if you don't take care of your feet. Because if you can't even get to the battle, if you can't even walk forward, if you can't even stand, then what good is it to have all the rest of the armor on? These shoes are sometimes underestimated. Look at the passage, the verse, one verse, and your Feet. What a funny thought. Feet are kind of funny things, aren't they? Some people like feet. Some people hate feet. Feet are very funny. And when you think about warfare and armor, one of the last things we think about often is our feet. But Paul drops right in the middle of this description the thought and the command of having our feet cared for. I think we're beginning to understand the importance of taking care of our feet. And I know that if my feet are not well, my left heel has been bothering me for a number of weeks. And uh, I have to walk carefully. I can only wear a certain pair of shoes because my left heel is constantly bothering me. And it is a reminder every time I take a step that there's something not quite right. And if you don't take care of your feet, then it renders you a little bit incapacitated. If your feet aren't in good shape, then the rest of your body is going to be hard to be in good shape. Think about it for a moment. Of all of your body parts, your two feet are the only two parts that support and carry the entirety of your body. All of the weight of your body is resting upon a few inches of flesh and bone. Interesting thought, isn't it? There are many people... Uh, many animals, many creatures who use more than two feet. Perhaps they run on four, or like a centipede, they have a whole lot more. But we use two feet. And if your feet aren't cared for, if your weight gets a little excessive and your feet can't handle the weight, then you find yourselves in trouble. Much of our forward progress depends upon these little appendages that we call feet. And so when Paul speaks about our feet, he's referring to a couple of things spiritually. He's referring to balance. I wonder this morning, have you got appropriate balance in your Christian life? Think about a man or a woman or a person trying to stand on their own two feet. If there is an appropriate balance or if one foot isn't what it ought to be, then the whole body is off balance, and if your whole body is off balance, then what good are you going to be in the heat of a battle? 
Some of you have no balance. You're double-minded. And a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You are unbalanced in your life. You give very little attention to the things that are eternal. Very little attention to spiritual matters, but you give an awful lot of attention to physical matters that aren't going to last. That's an unbalanced life. If you give time and energy to making your flesh look good, but you neglect the part that nobody sees but the physical eye, your soul, then you are unbalanced and you're not fit to fight. If you give all the attention to the kind of shoes that you purchase and the suntan on your face and on your arms and the highlights in your hair and the makeup on your face and the paint on the end of your fingernails, if you give all of the attention to that outward, I'm not saying those things are necessarily bad, but when all of your energy and attention goes there, to the neglect of the inner man, you are unbalanced. And you can never stand in the battle. Paul refers not just to balance, but I believe he refers to progress. You can't move forward without your feet. Well, we can today with the help of wheelchairs and people carrying you and things like that. But typically speaking, in a battle, in a war, Physically speaking, you're not advancing without your feet. And if you don't take care of your feet, what Paul speaks about here, he's speaking about your forward progress. Would you look here for a moment? I wonder, are you further ahead in your Christian life now than you were a year ago? Are you listening? Are you advancing in faith? Or are you retreating? Where are you today, spiritually? Are you moving forward? Are you making progress? Are you more godly today? Are you more like Christ now? Are you more spiritually alert? Do you have clearer vision today than you did last year? Or are you hanging out last year, hanging out in the past without making advancement and forward progress? So when Paul speaks about your feet, he's talking about progress, advancing in your Christian walk. And you cannot help but think about the fourfold command four times in this passage. Paul says, stand, 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 stand. And where do we stand but on our feet? So in many ways, this little verse refers to to the entirety of what Paul is trying to display in this portion. We've got to be able to stand. I wonder, are you even standing? Through the scripture, feet are sometimes a symbol of dominion. I like this thought. Couldn't help but uh, thinking, think of Romans chapter 16 and verse number 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly so oftentimes feet are a picture of dominion and conquest do you have victory in your life are you victorious over sin in your life are you victorious over particular vices that have held you ransom for many years do you have dominion and victory i hope you do malachi the last prophet of the old testament writes and and uh, the Fourth chapter, verses one to three. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked. For they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. What a promise. Victory, dominion, conquest. Jesus told his disciples in Luke chapter 10 and verse number 19, Behold, I give unto you power, to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. What a promise. 
power to tread on scorpions and serpents. Speaking of more than just slithering snakes. He's not telling us that we ought to walk into a zoo somewhere into the snake display and, and see if we can walk on top of snakes without getting bitten. What he is saying is all the attacks and devices of Satan will have no power over you if our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What's he mean, feet being shod? Feet don't, on, don't only, they do not just speak of dominion, but they also speak of direction. I couldn't help but thinking, think of the, the words of advice that Solomon gave to his children in the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 5, he warns my son, verse number 1, attend to my wisdom, bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion and that thy lips may keep knowledge for the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb. And her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Feet often in the Bible refer to direction, where you're headed. And so when Paul speaks about having your feet shod, he's talking about having victory and dominion and conquering but he's also talking about the direction that your life is headed. Would you look here? Where are you going? Where are you going? Well, I'm going on holiday. You may say, no, no, no. Where are you going spiritually? Are you going anywhere? Do you know where you're going? Do you know where you want to be? Some people wander around aimlessly like somebody spun a top and let it go. Some people live their lives like that. No direction, no guidance. And Solomon warns his son about a woman who looks attractive. It can be more than just a woman. Something that looks attractive, but the end of it is death. We're living in a day where there is so little spiritual discernment. So very little spiritual discernment. I heard recently of a man taking his family uh, to a church, a particular church, a particular denomination. And well, what's wrong with that? No discernment about the things, the false teachings that are taught there. Zero discernment. What's the big deal if we just go one service or two services? It's a nice thing. My friend invited me. It's a, not a very nice thing if you expose your children to false teaching and corruption. Very little discernment. It's not necessarily about what's there at face value. It's about where it will take you. People are so foolish about the decisions they make. What's wrong with this without thinking about where it's going to go? And feet speak about direction. The author of Hebrews spoke about this. Occasionally somebody gets hurt in life. That's part of life, isn't it? Sometimes our hurt comes from the chastening hand of God. Sometimes it comes from our own silly mistakes. But the scriptures, the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number, verse number 12, Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. Would you look here? If you don't know where you're going, if you don't make straight paths for your feet, then the first time you're hurt and injured, you're going to be out of the way. I've seen it, haven't you? I've seen believers, I've seen Christians get hurt. Maybe they got hurt in a local church. Maybe they got hurt by a Christian, maybe a minister, they were hurt. And because they did not know that where they were going spiritually, because they weren't thinking spiritually, because direction wasn't in front of them, they went out of the way. Now they're nowhere to be found. Feet speak about direction. So when Paul says having your feet shod. He's saying having your feet protected. Horses get their feet, their hooves shod. We used to use that terminology in America. I don't know if you did here. We grew up with horses and I worked on a horse farm for a number of years and the horses were being shod or shooed. The man would come. We had an Amish man that would come. Someone would pick him up, collect him and bring him. And there he would come with his horseshoes and his nails and his, and his, uh, his little device where he trimmed the hooves of the horses and clipped them. The biggest pair of toenail clippers I've ever seen. And he'd make those feet ready to place those metal shoes on so that the horse would be protected and able to walk wherever needed. 
So what is this shoe that protects our feet, that protects our direction, that gives us dominion and victory? What is this shoe? The Bible says it's the preparation of the gospel of peace. Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's a shoe entitled, can you imagine going to the, the Nike store and saying, I'd like to have that latest edition, please, that won the preparation of the gospel of peace. And they said, what? That was the title of the shoe. The shoe shod, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's got two parts to think about here. The preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace is a little bit easier to understand. We'll come to that in a moment. But the preparation simply means this. Readiness. Amen. A readiness. If a soldier is wearing this, he's a whole lot more ready for battle than if he's wearing this. Sorry, Carmen. He's ready. Ready for battle. Ready for war. If your feet are, if you're sat down with your feet propped up and your toes, not, not anything at Maggie here, but if your toes in the air, she's got a sore ankle. But if that's the way you're living your Christian life, figuratively speaking, you're not ready. You're not ready for the attack of the enemy. We had one of the little girls here this past week. We're playing down at Crown Hall without her shoes on and and uh, there in the place where we have a, fi a fire pit in the ashes, it's, I suppose she thought it felt nice, those soft ashes on her feet. But uh, there's glass and metal and all sorts of other things that some, some probably some student or something put down there. And there she was walking, treading on, on that, those ashes that are very soft, and she sliced her foot and had to be taken in to get some stitches. Because she didn't have shoes on, she wasn't ready. She wasn't ready for that. The preparation, the readiness that a soldier needs. Just as combat boots prepare a soldier for marching orders, the gospel of peace makes ready the Christian soldier to march. Amen. David Livingston, when he first went to Africa, they say that the one part of his equipment that mesmerized the African people more than anything was the fact that he had no toes. In fact, they called him no toes. And the reason for that was because for, for many, many years, uh, the people that he was ministering to had no shoes. And here was a man with boots on, something they'd never seen before. And it mesmerized him. And they began to look at these shoes like an Englishman never looked at shoes. In fact, in their mind, they understood that every time David Livingston took a step, it was like somebody rolled out a carpet of leather underneath of him. So everywhere he walked, Somebody was walking in front of him, rolling out the red carpet. Can you imagine that principle? And that's exactly the thought we get when thinking about our feet being shod, prepared with the gospel of peace. Every step we take, everywhere we go, there's this underlying protection of the gospel of peace. We'll talk about that here in a second. Quite a remarkable thing when you think about this idea of our feet Constantly prepared. William Gurnall, the Puritan who wrote extensively on this subject, wrote literally hundreds and hundreds of pages on the armor of God. He gave 150 pages to the feet being shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Don't worry, I'm not going to preach his 150 pages this morning. But one thing I thought was very interesting was the way that he explained what this was, what this shoe was. And here's how he described it. That our feet being shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace was our feet being fitted with boots which indicated and represented a gracious, heavenly, and excellent spirit. Every step we take, a gracious, heavenly, excellent spirit must cover us. Now, do you know why they say the, that Christianity is not advancing the way that it ought to? Do you know what they say? Do you know what the secularists and the humanists and the atheists say as to why Christianity is not advancing? They say because there is an inconsistency between the words that a Christian speaks and the way that he lives. And because there be such an inconsistency, 
between what we say and how we live, it's as if somebody took the shoes off of our feet. Every step we take, we are not clothed with a gracious, heavenly, and excellent spirit. We're not representing the gospel of peace. We're not taking the gospel of peace with us. We are not displaying the spirit of Jesus Christ wherever we go. Do you remember the story of Pilgrim's Progress when John Bunyan made his way to the, on his way to the celestial city and he stopped at the palace, beautiful, and they brought him into the armory. Do you remember that story? And they brought him in there and one of the things that Bunyan commented on was the walls and walls and rows and rows and rows of boots, shoes. He commented as well that there were shoes that never gave out. Shoes that never wore thin. Reminds me of that verse we read earlier today. Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 25. And thy shoes shall be iron and brass. Doesn't sound very comfortable. But I remind you the Christian life isn't about comfort. It's about endurance. It's about victory and conquering. And somehow a rubber sole doesn't sound quite as dangerous as a brass soul. And so our shoes are promised these, this excellent spirit, this Christ-like spirit is promised that it will never wear out if we wear it. Yeah. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass and as thy days so, so shall thy strength be. Our strength shall not give out and our strength is not in our aggressiveness. Our strength is in the spirit of Christ. The problem is often not, is not that our that our shoes wear out, that our spirit wears out. Our problem is instead that we lay it aside. Our problem is is we get uncomfortable in the Christian life when we take the shoes off of our feet. And every time you take that 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 loveliness of Christ off, you've left yourself vulnerable. Think about it. The gospel of peace prepares you for suffering. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace prepares you for battle, but it prepares you for suffering. If you're not wearing the gospel of peace when, when hard times hit you, you're not ready for suffering. If you're not walking in the spirit of Christ when difficulty comes, you're not ready. You're not prepared. It prepares you for advancement. It prepares you for suffering. It prepares you for all that Satan throws at you. But if you're not wearing the spirit of Christ, then you're not ready. It is peace with God that gives us a readiness to fight, isn't it? It's peace with God that gives you boldness. Look, God's, if God be for me, who can be against me? Let's go. But if you don't have peace with God, you're not ready to go. You're back home trying to figure it all out. But when you know that God is with you, and when you know that God is on your side, then you're ready to fight. You're emboldened by the fact that the creator of the universe is by your side. Hallelujah. What an amazing thought that brings, that, that gospel of peace brings boldness. Without this peace, though, the fight is burdensome. Without that peace, the fight is impractical and undesirable. So we must consciously, although our shoes are promised to never wear out, we must consciously take care of them and consciously ensure that we are walking in the gospel of peace. That the gospel of peace is being applied to our own hearts and minds every day so that it can therefore thus be applied to others. If it hadn't been applied to you today, then how are you going to offer it to somebody else? If you're not thinking and living, understanding that everywhere you go, the peace of God is upon you and with you. That God is with you. If you're not thinking that way, then you're, you're not going to be able to offer the gospel with any sort of effectiveness to anybody. Prepared. Prepared to fight. Prepared to suffer. Prepared to represent the Savior. I can't help but think of that passage, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring glad tidings. And the reason for that is because they be wearing the shoes of the gospel of peace. Now, I know some people who get very offended very easily. And that's evidence that they're not wearing 
these shoes. There's no peace. Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. So when peace is missing, when you are easily offended, it's because your feet aren't shod. You haven't put your shoes on this morning. You get very easily blown off track, agitated, offended. The shoes of the gospel of peace protect you against that. Put them on. Put them on every morning. So that the direction that you're taking is the direction that the spirit of Christ takes you. Put them on in the morning. So that no matter how many traps that Satan lays for you, your feet are protected. Your walk is protected. You have victory over sin in the accusations of Satan. And when you put your shoes on in the morning, it doesn't mean that Satan's are not going to attack you, but it means that when he does attack you, you have victory. He's going to be placed beneath your feet. They tell me that in those days, although they wore sandals, those sandals were studded, almost like a pair of football boots, so that a soldier could be standing fast. And that's what we need. The gospel of peace allows us to stand fast. Without it, we're easily knocked over. Without it, we're unprepared. Without it, we're not ready to represent the Savior with this excellent Christ-like spirit. I wonder, are you bearing that spirit today? Are you wearing it today? One last thought and I'll close. If you're wearing a pair of leather shoes, as almost all shoes once were, it's a reminder that every time you look at that pair of leather shoes, someone had to die for you to have those shoes. So it is with these shoes. The Lord Jesus had to die so that you might have peace with God. And every step you take is a step made and offered in sacrifice. That'll help you be willing to make a bit of sacrifice as you walk through this life. Have you got your shoes on? Are you ready? I hope you are. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give thanks unto thee for the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from all our sin. We give thanks that a sacrifice has been made so that we might be victorious, more than conquerors, in Christ Jesus our Lord. We ask of the Lord, help us. Help us to be mindful that if we are to walk in the right direction, we must be guided by thy spirit. We must be enabled and helped by that Christ-likeness. We pray, Father, that we would recognize there is no victory or dominion over sin except it be by the gospel of peace. And I pray that we might be ready to represent the in battle. That every step we take is made with that excellent spirit, that Christ-like spirit. Lord, help us. May we be those who are ready to proclaim the gospel truth. Ready to stand firm against the wiles and the attacks of Satan. We thank thee, Lord, that thou hast provided and prepared all things for us. So that we might be prepared for thee. In Christ Jesus' name. We ask these things. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our final hymn together, please. Let's sing that third hymn again. That was a very appropriate hymn. As thy days, thy strength shall be. I wonder if there's a little button on that piano that can take it up or not. Look at those words. We've just, we sang them a moment ago. Let's sing them again. Afflicted saints to Christ draw near. Your Savior's gracious promise here. His faithful word you can believe that as your days, your strength shall be. That is a promise. You have all you need, but you must take it. You must take it and use it. Let's stand and sing together that third hymn again, please.
Thank you for coming. Let's pray. If you have any concern or question you'd like to speak with somebody after the meeting, then please, please let us know. But let's pray. Hope you'll join us for lunch today and be back with us for the meetings that follow. Father, we give thanks unto thee for thy kindness to us, that all things have been prepared for us, that in goodness and grace and mercy thou hast laid out for us such an armor Everything has been thought of. Help us to take it, Lord. Help us to walk in it. May our feet be directed by Thee. Pray, Lord, that Thy Word would be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, that we would not be guided by the whims of society, by the ever-changing opinions of men, but that it would be Thy Word, by Thy Spirit, that guides our steps. We thank thee, Lord, that there is protection against the attacks of Satan. We rejoice, Father, that there is discernment that is granted to the believer. And I pray that we might wear, ever wear, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of the gospel, the gospel of peace. We rejoice that there is now, therefore, no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. We rejoice, Father, We've been justified by faith and have peace with thee. We pray that we might bear, ever bear, the message of the gospel of peace faithfully. Wherever we tread, wherever we walk, help us, we pray. I pray for those who are unstable in their Christian walk right now. Those who are not advancing, but they seem to be stagnant and stuck. Especially the ones that don't even realize it. Show them, Lord, that thy body may advance together. That we may take on new territory for thee. We rejoice, Lord, that we are a part of a conquering army. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We rejoice to know that although the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing, thou art the one that sitteth upon the throne, ever in control, always sovereign, We rejoice. Help us, Lord, to march on. Help us be ready to stand, to honor Thee, to represent our Savior well. Bless our brothers and sisters. We pray for those who are lost, save their souls. We pray, Lord, for Thy blessing upon the rest of this day. We pray that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Ghost would be with us this day and forevermore, for we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.